Raul Castro, a different leader, obviously, from Fidel, and that, that, that helped. Well, there is the age factor, uh, the time factor involved here. Um, it was tremendously difficult for anything like this to occur while Fidel Castro was still in power. The fact that his brother has taken over and Fidel is now in the background and that Raul has said that he's going to retire in 2018 opens a window for the future which means that the sort of symbolic, historic kind of factors behind this, co this conflict are receding and as it recedes then it becomes easier to make diplomatic moves like this. You've been there many times. How has the trade embargo, the difficulties of the last 54 years, how has that affected Cuba? Enormously and one of the big problems that face the uh, negotiations going forward from today is the fact that the Cubans are claiming reparations for the trade embargo plus numerous other um, activities including terrorist acts uh, up to the tune of 200 billion dollars now that is a massive claim against the United States and it's something that they've put on the table already Stephen we're just gonna listen in uh, because it is a historic moment let's just uh, join the moment in Washington where the Cuban flag is raised A very symbolic moment and one, one they're enjoying. Yeah, well, you can hear them shouting Fidel, Fidel, Fidel. To the Cubans, this is quite a, a victory for what they regard as a steadfast determination by the leadership not to surrender, to give in to the United States. So the uh, fact that the Americans have chosen to change their policy means that this is for the Cubans a victory. We're about to hear, I think, briefly from the Cuban foreign minister and of course while this is happening in Washington similar ceremony in Havana and what will change in Cuba in, in the next few months as a result of this? Well things are already already changing quite remarkably the, um, the growth in the economy has been remarkable it's nearly five percent in the first six months of this year and the number of tourist visitors, uh, tourists and visitors to Cuba is increasing by about 46% this year. So the economy is picking up dramatically quickly after this change. And it is linked to the change that Obama's made. How much of that is because people want to see the old Cuba, that people know it's about to change beyond recognition? It's very interesting. The market research has shown that people are choosing to go to Cuba from all over the world, Europe especially, uh, Britain inclusive and people are coming back saying well we wanted to go before the Americans ruin it interestingly a lot of Americans are going and they're saying the same thing we want to see it before we ruin it which is a really interesting fact it's just look, look, looking at the smiles listening to them sing the anthems um, many of these people were looking at grew up at a time where these two countries hardly spoke to each other and the spectre obviously of the Cold War hung, hung heavy over the whole place well, it, you have to remember that it was only as recently as 2003 when George Bush Jr. was in office that Cuba was uh, actually seriously contemplating that they might invade. Um, so the turnaround in the relationship is really remarkable in a very short space of time. And, and yes, these people have lived through um, uh, very difficult days. You must remember also that in the 1990s, Cuba was virtually, I mean, left 
completely alone and many, many people suffered great hardship as a consequence of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the fact that the United States made the embargo tougher during those years. So they withstood a great deal. So they're feeling pretty pleased with themselves because this, for them, like I said, is, is, is a victory. Difficult to imagine, 1963, Cuban Missile Crisis, the world on the brink, and everybody knew then where Cuba was geographically. And uh, there will be many Cubans, and hearing the name Fidel shouted out there, many Cubans who will say this is, this is quite a U-turn. It is. One must also uh, have uh, a slight sort of uh, sense of, uh, uh, not fear, but concern if you're a Cuban as to the way in which the Americans have changed their policy. Many people in Cuba are rather suspicious. They don't feel as though the leopard can change its spots so easily. And some people are saying that, you know, although he said we're not in the business of regime change anymore, actually what they're doing is altering their policy with the hope of being able to subvert the country in a, in a different way. So the Cubans are not dropping their guard entirely. And like I say, there's a lot of negotiations to go before they can actually really, what we might say, call them normal relations uh, can be created. But with the flag now flying in the United States capital, the, the, the phrase money talks probably will kick in. <laughs> Well, yes, except to say that the Cuban government is very uh, careful to point out that what it wants to do is to diversify its relationships with various countries. So, in other words, it's, it's b developing its relationship with Russia, with China, with India, with Brazil, and these countries together um, really are beating a path to Havana's door right now before the American embargo is, is dropped so that they're positioning themselves quite strongly there. So in actual fact, for Cuba, this is a big opportunity because it means that there is um, uh, a great deal of interest from these other countries, which are in some ways rivals to the United States, either regionally or globally, who, who are wanting to position themselves in Cuba as a, as a way of getting a, a hand in the, in the deck, if you like, vis-a-vis uh, -vis their relationships with the United States. So diplomatically, Cuba's in a very, very fortunate position right now. Well, it is a moment of history, the Cuban flag there outside their new embassy in Washington. Uh, Stephen Wilkinson, thank you very much for sharing that moment with us. Thank Not you. at all. Thank, thank you very you. much indeed. Thanks. Right, it's time for the sport. There's rather a lot going on. Ollie Foster has all the details. <laughs> Certainly is, Simon. Many thanks indeed. Uh, every player has teed off in the final round of the Open at St Andrews. Amateur Paul Dunn was in a three-way three tie for the lead overnight. It's not there anymore. Let's head straight to the course at St Andrews. Join our reporter Ben Smith. Hello again, Ben. Dunn made a bit of a poor start. It looks like the busiest people on the course, though, are going to be those changing the leaderboard today. That's right, Ollie. Uh, an astonishing start to this final round here at the 144th Open Championship. As you say, Paul Dunn started the day as a joint leader of this championship. He's now not even the leading amateur at this championship, which I think shows you how quickly things are changing. Uh, he bogeyed the first two holes uh, with a couple of poor shots, looked a bit nervy, and he's since picked up a birdie at the third. But it just shows you how tricky and how much pressure are, uh, is on these players this afternoon. Now, the very latest I have for you is that the American Zach Johnson, the 2007 Masters champion, the Ryder Cup player, is leading this championship. He's now got to 14 under par with some fantastic birdies early in his round. He's just reaching uh, the eighth hole now and uh, playing very nicely indeed. But incredibly, we've got six players tied at 13 under par, including Jason Day, Adam Scott, uh, and a host of other players there that can all challenge, have all got great experience of winning uh, big tournaments. And they're really stacking up here. It's hard to see how we're going to avoid a four-hole playoff come uh, late uh, evening. And as the weather worsens all the time, I suppose it's making it more and more difficult for the players. We've had rain, high winds, and those who've got in and made their scores perhaps uh, are grateful for that. But um, incredible drama here. It's changing so quickly, it's hard to keep up with. And there's a lot of fantastic golf being played out on the old course. It's a leaderboard as changeable as the weather, isn't it, Ben? Uh, uh, if there is a, a four-hole playoff, what would that entail? As if this championship hadn't dragged on long enough anyway, because we're in this Monday finish because of all that bad weather we had on Friday and Saturday. That's absolutely right, Ollie. It, it's, uh, it would entail 
uh, the players, however many there are, we, we don't know at this stage, playing the 1st, the 2nd, the 17th and the 18th. Uh, that could obviously take us on into the night. We expect the leaders to finish around about 7 p.m., uh, so clearly that could add to that. Uh, but the crowds here have been huge today. They've got some fantastic value for money. They've got in for £10 in many cases with children coming in for free. And they're absolutely loving the action. They're seeing Jordan Spieth. I've been following out uh, for his round. And um, just as I'm speaking now, I can tell you that Adam Scott, the Australian who's won major championships himself, has also gone to 14 under par, joint leader with Zach Johnson. That shows you just how quickly things are changing. It's hard to keep up with. We're doing our very best to do just that. You're doing very well, Ben. Uh, things will have changed by the next time we speak. It is uh, People's Monday it is anyone's championship by the looks of it. Uh, England's cricket selectors will meet tomorrow to decide if they change the side for the third Ashes test. The coach, Trevor Bayliss, says they had their backside slapped at Lords as Australia levelled the series with a 405-run victory. When the team's not actually playing, playing like you would like, um, those things are always in the back of coaches and selectors' minds, I think. But um, what you've also got to do is, is give the players that are in there, um, try and give them as much confidence as possible as well. I mean, they're obviously good players, and the reason they're in the team is you know, they're thought of as the best players uh, in England at the moment. There's about half an hour left uh, of stage 16 at the Tour de France. Team Sky's Chris Froome is in the yellow jersey with a three-minute lead. He and his teammates have been abused by some spectators over the past few days. Urine was thrown at Froome over the weekend while Richie Port was punched earlier in the Tour. Another teammate, Luke Rowe, blames the French media. The reason people treat us like that is because... It's what it's all they know is what they read in the press. So what they read in the press, they, that, that, that's their opinion. They, they're, they're not clever enough to think of something themselves. What they read in a trashy newspaper, and that's what they think is 100% genuine. That's all your sport for now. Azzy Farney is going to have more for you in the next hour and beyond. Simon. Ollie Foster, thank you very much. David Cameron says countering extremism is the struggle of our generation. Speaking this lunchtime to an audience in Birmingham, the Prime Minister said there had been a failure of integration in the country. Mr Cameron was outlining the government's five-year plan to combat ISIS-inspired radicalisation. Well, joining me now from Birmingham is Jahan Mahmood, whose former advisor to the government's Prevent Strategy now runs a de-radicalisation programme. Good afternoon to you. Good afternoon to you. Is he focusing on the right part of this problem? I found his uh, speech on the whole to be balanced. The only issue that I really have is his disproportionate focus on ideology. The ideology has actually existed before the war on terror began. And if that was the main motivation for Muslims to turn inwards and against Britain, that's not true because this only really shifted. There was a paradigm shift after the Iraq war where, for instance, the two individuals who are responsible for deaths on British soil, Mohammed Sadiq Khan, the ringleader of 7-7, and Adab Alaja both cited foreign policy. And what the government shouldn't do and has done continually is sidestepped its own faults. It's not just about foreign issues, it's domestic issues as well, where, for instance, for a long time, Muslims have felt like they're not part of mainstream Britain. I welcome today's speech because, on the whole, he is focusing on about He's talking about cohesion. He's talking about um, making people feel more welcome in Britain, feel more integrated. So I think those elements of what he said today were definitely welcomed. So on the basis that much of the damage has been done, uh, and this is a repair exercise, if you like, you, you must hold your breath when you see that there's consideration, say, of going into Syria, putting British forces back on the ground in another country. Yes, that's a very good point. I mean, one of the things that we're talking about here and the Prime Minister mentions is British values, democracy, freedom of expression. Now, the government were defeated over going into Syria, and now we're hearing that we are conducting air assaults in Syria. That kind of defies the very ideals that we are trying to stand firm to. And the government, once again, is demonstrating its inability to uphold its own value system that it expects other people to respect. I, I suppose what people may wonder is how do you instill a sense of belonging of that integration the Prime Minister talks about when youngsters are disaffected who feel that they live in a country that offers them nothing that in many ways alienates them. 
Is that an ideology issue, or is that is, is I, I, what is it? And do you come across a lot of that? I do come across a low sense of belonging. Going back to 2010, the Labour administration at the time conducted a pretty impressive survey in largely cities that had dense Muslim populations. And one thing that was unanimous was a low sense of belonging and racism. Now, that's something that I definitely come across. Now, to counter some elements of that, we shouldn't forget that approximately one million Muslims just from the Indian subcontinent, mainly coming from what we call Pakistan today, fought for Britain, its freedoms, and its values when it itself was subjugated. And the descendants of those men live on these aisles today, of course, as stakeholders. It would be nice to get that kind of narrative out to try and improve relations. Simultaneously, it's also important that uh, to mention the far-right um, threat. And that's something that I welcome once again. The, the Prime Minister mentioned that. There is actually, there has been something that is concerning a lot of uh, members of the Muslim community, and it's the media's inability to sometimes um, categorize and describe far-right extremists for terrorist acts. So, for instance, there was a event recently by Zach Davis, who uh, almost killed um, a, a, a Sikh gentleman with a machete. And he had very clear uh, supremacist, far-right, ideological motivators. And he wasn't called a terrorist. And this inability to call it out as it is also then makes some young Muslims feel like they're getting, um, they're getting it all the time, and it's unfair. The charges against them, there should be some level of fairness, and I find that too as well. But there are elements of what the gov uh, sorry, of what the prime minister said today, that were warmly welcomed. For instance, this idea that Muslims want to take over the country—it's ludicrous. And this, the other thing is on the other end of the spectrum that there's some Jewish cabal running global affairs. I think that's really important to counter as well, because that leads into anti-Semitism. So there were points that he mentioned today that were warmly welcomed by the Muslim community. Um, and we feel that it was, on the whole, it was much more nuanced. It was just the disproportionate focus on ideology. We need to understand that there are a variety of reasons why young men become pretty extremely radicalized. Mental health